Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual forum for the Washoe County School District and our staff. I'm Interim Superintendent Kristen McNeil. On behalf of the Washoe County School District trustees and our entire staff, I want to thank you for joining us tonight for the 2024-2025 fiscal year budget. This is a time when you're going to be able to provide your input, your feedback, and your suggestions to how our budget looks. We truly value everyone's input and want to provide a convenient and easy way. And our virtual forum is one way that we do that. We have enjoyed much success with this particular format. Tonight, we're coming from our boardroom, and this is live stream on our YouTube channel. This recording will also be archived on our website. The trustees are also watching. Hello, trustees. Along with you, as all of as all of them understand the budgeting process. I'd like to begin by introducing our panel, and we're gonna start with Mr. Mathers. Hi, I'm Mark Mathers, Chief Financial Officer. Great to have you here with us tonight. Good evening, my name is Joe Ernst. I'm the Chief Continuous Improvement Officer, and glad to have everyone with us tonight. Hello, uh, Paul LaMarca, Chief Student and Family Supports Officer, I, and um, thank you for being here. Good evening, Troy Parks, Chief Academic Officer. Good evening, Jeff Bozzo, Budget Director. And Chris Turner, Chief Information Officer. Thank you all so much. So for our event tonight, uh, Mr. Mathers and Jeff Bozzo, they're going to go through um, the technical aspects of our budget. And then they, this is high level information and some of it is pretty complex. Um, and there's fairly technical matters that they'll go into detail about. But after our presentation, we're going to open it up for questions and our delightful communication staff will field those questions. And then we also have our leadership team members here who will help to answer some of those questions. Amber, will you please let us know um, about our question and answer period? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, my name is Amber Seifert. I am with the Office of Communications and Community Engagement and I'll be moderating and asking questions this evening. Thank you, Superintendent McNeil. We're very interested in hearing from all of our staff who submitted questions. If you would still like to submit questions, you are able to do so at the email address wcsd underscore communications at washoschools.net. Um, we have already received questions from the community and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. We plan to conclude the virtual budget forum around 6.30 so we can get to questions between 6.30 and 7 p.m. Uh, we may not get to all of the questions this evening. Um, if we do not get to them tonight, we will email you back with an answer within the week. We also, uh, we will also group questions together. Uh, we may not answer them all individually, so if we receive multiple questions of the same nature, those will be grouped into one question. And now I will turn this back over to Interim Superintendent McNeil. Thank you so much, Amber. So as you all know, this budget um, impacts our students, all of you, our, our staff members, and then obviously all of our families. So what we talk about tonight is incredibly important to all of us. In addition to Mark and Jeff, um, as I stated earlier, we do have our leadership team members here who will also help address some of your questions. I hope we get a lot of participation from you all tonight um, in your questions so questions um, into um, the link that you were provided uh, this afternoon so with that I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mathers great thank you very much Dr. McNeil um, I am actually very excited to start this presentation off um, it has been many many years since Washoe County School District had um, a significant amount of new funding to invest in our students and schools. And um, this year's budget process is that first time in, in decades, I, I, think, I think it's safe to say, in which we have the resources to really contemplate how we can first execute the new strategic plan of the district, but, but more importantly, again, to invest in our schools and provide additional um, supports and services to our students and staff. And, so this was an exciting prospect we all had. Um, uh, tonight, we'll, I will kick off and, and talk about some of those technical aspects of the budget process. And then really because this year's process was a collective consensus effort of our board, 
uh, the public through the strategic plan and our executive team. I'm going to turn it over really to our academic leadership team, Dr. Parks, Joe Ernst, Paula Marca, to give the bulk of, uh, to provide the, the summary of the bulk of this presentation because they were really instrumental in developing these recommendations. Again, the executive team met a number of times as we uh, prioritized uh, budget requests and so forth and came to a, the draft plan that you see here tonight. And so they're going to talk about specific budget recommendations um, and, and will be available to answer questions about those specific budget requests. Um, so uh, let me skip around a little bit um, to steal a line from Talking Heads. Well, how did we get here? Um, you uh, may recall legislative session last year. The legislature approved $1 billion in additional annual funding for K through 12. And certainly, Washoe County School District saw a significant share of that additional $1 billion in funding. Um, for um, our district, um, we saw an additional $98 million in annual general fund revenues. And as you know, the bulk of that actually went towards additional compensation for our staff. Um, and that was appropriate, and that was uh, the uh, top uh, plank in the, our Board of Trustees legislative platform. And so that's where most of that $98 million went. But we did uh, make a decision, the Board did, to reserve $10 million for implementation of the strategic plan. And so that's what the budget process this year focused on was how would we spend that $10 million to implement the new strategic plan over the next three to five years. And so that's what the bulk of, of tonight's presentation will cover. In addition to that, though, we see we saw an additional uh, $11 million in funding for our at-risk students as defined by the state and an additional $16 million for English learners. And so that was really great to see as well, that the legislature recognized the additional supports these students needed and funded it to a much greater extent than ever before. So. Again, that's how we kind of got here and have the additional funding um, that we do and, and why we need to make decisions on how to utilize that funding. So to kind of go backwards then, so again, the Board of Trustees last year allocated $10 million for implementation of the strategic plan. And for many of you, you went through that process, gave input to that process. We also received community feedback on our strategic plan. Out of that process, there were five, as you see here on this slide, that came out of that process. Those are the five goals of the strategic plan. And for each and every goal, there are actually very specific action steps underneath those goals. So for strong start for every child, our first goal, there's three or four action steps underneath that that call for the district to make very specific steps towards uh, investing in that area, and that continues for the next four goals too. So when the executive team met, and I use that kind of loosely because the executive team's directors underneath worked on this plan as well, staff, a lot of staff put together this plan. Uh, but for we made sure that we addressed each and every action step for each and every strategic plan goal. That was really important to us to have that kind of a disciplined process. And the reason for that is one of the classic blunders of a lot of agencies when they develop a strategic plan is not talking about how will we implement that and how much money do we need to implement that. Here at Washoe County School District, we didn't make that mistake. Again, the board kind of very prudently reserved this money um, for this very reason, it, uh, investing in all of these areas, and so you'll see that tonight. Um, so again, the strategic plan very much guided this process, but in addition to that, um, you know, through the years certainly and through the, over the last, the course of the last year, we've had a lot of feedback from schools and staff that have gone up through staff, our associate chiefs and others here, and that was very important. And of course, our board hears um, that feedback from our staff and families. And so that drove a lot of the recommendations you see here. These come from uh, whether they're emails, conversations, feedback in other community budgeting processes that we've had over the years. 
we were mindful of kind of those priorities expressed through those different processes. Um, certainly we heard loud and clear during the budget process last year in this one as well that we needed to emphasize people over programs. And, and what that means is instead of embracing maybe the, the latest program du jour uh, and executing kind of a new approach, we wanted to first make sure that we could address our staffing levels. Because again, we've had very few resources over the last decade since the Great Recession. And so we know we need to add staff in many, many areas. Um, one cautionary note I would make is $10 million is a lot of money, but it doesn't go as far as we want. So even after this process, we recognize that there wasn't the funding to address all of those staffing needs that we saw across the district. It's just a fact of life. So again, we had to prioritize. But that was important, again, to put staffing over programs. And then also importantly, we know class sizes are a huge issue in this district. And so that was a priority as we move through the budget process and prioritize. And when we could, we look to lower class sizes or caseloads for our staff. The one caveat to that at the bottom of the slide that you can see is we know we've had challenges filling even our existing positions. And so that's just a reality in the current labor market that we need to be sensitive to. And so for a number of the recommendations you'll see here tonight, there's actually a multi-year phased approach. Uh, we recognize we probably won't be able to find enough people to fill all of the new positions we've kind of laid out in this plan. And so we want to be very deliberate about that and don't want to, you know, we want to manage those expectations, but also prudently budget to match, you know, the number of positions we think we can fill over time. So that is a summary somewhat of the process we used. Hope that was helpful. Certainly uh, able to answer any questions again about any of the technical aspects or, you know, kind of the revenue picture we faced. Um, at this point, though, I plan to uh, turn it over to Joe Ernst, who's going to talk about the major themes of the budget process. Thank you, Mr. Mathers. So as Mr. Mathers outlined, really we had some guiding principles, and these principles really helped guide the budgetary conversations and the budgetary decisions. As Mr. Mathers mentioned, really we've had a we've had a focus on providing additional personnel to buildings. And that really comes in the form of supporting our highest needs schools to su support our highest needs students. We also used goal four academic growth and achievement as really one of our North stars in all of these budgetary decisions. One of the things that we also did was really make sure that we looked across all levels of our system, and that includes down in pre-K, early childhood, all the way up to 12th grade programs. Also related to goal two, we know that student engagement and student belonging is essential for student success in our schools. And so as um, Dr. LaMarco will talk about later in the presentation, you've noticed that we've put a lot of emphasis on increased student belonging and student engagement in our schools. And then the final theme that was focused on were around the implementation of school-wide improvements that impacts students in schools. And it's important as a large system that we are making system-wide improvements that ultimately better support our schools. So those are some of the major themes that drove our budgetary decisions. So we'll move forward with the recommendation for implementation of the strategic plan. First, we have our collaborative schools, and collaborative schools are a group of 12 schools that are some of our most in-need schools based on their learning outcome data over the past couple of years, along with state designations from the Nevada Department of Education. Our collaborative schools will receive additional support in the form of instructional coaches. We are excited that up at middle school we'll be providing math coaches as well. And we're also looking to provide long-term support for interventions at our schools. Additionally, 
we have a school performance support coordinator along with our TNTP partners that also help these schools. And so what we've identified in Washoe County School District is a real commitment to supporting our lowest performing schools. Along those same lines, we wanted to make sure that we reduced class sizes in fourth and fifth grade, particularly at our one and two star schools. We recognize that lower class sizes are going to allow for more individualized feedback from our teachers. And we also recognize that this doesn't just have an impact in elementary school, but better prepares our fourth and fifth grade students as they progress through middle school. We continue to see outstanding results in high school with our intercession and summer school, and we'll continue to provide academic supports for all high schools going into next year. And finally, we have funding for three graduation advocates at our high school. Really, again, as we talk about what guides us as a system, getting our students to graduate is very much at the center of our work, and these positions help to support those efforts. As we continue forward, we have also identified our English learners as a priority. Our data has told us that our English language learners have plateaued over the past couple of years, and we want to intensify the supports that we're providing those students. To, those, to, to that end, we have deepened our positions with our newcomer programming. And what you can also see is that we've reduced the ratio. We've moved back from 70 to one to 60 to one. And again, when we talk about people over programs. This is going to help our teachers be able to provide better support serving less students on their overall caseload and being more intensive with the support that they provide. Certainly as we develop the new English learner model, we also have coordinator positions and these positions replicate some of the models that we have established within our special education uh, department where our coordinators are out supporting our teachers front and center, providing them with the professional learning and the supports they need to ensure our students are gaining good language acquisition skills. And then finally, what we see is we have teacher assistance and we've been able to shift those costs. What's happened there is it's helped us also augment the overall programming that we have for our English learning students. So those are a few of the additional supports that we're providing for our high need schools. With that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Ernst. I'm going to review our supports for academic achievement. As Mark has mentioned, this is where we put the emphasis of our funds. Our core business is our learning outcomes. So first, we wanted to remove the barriers that our high school students might face when they want to take advanced courses. So in the future, we will have uh, IB, advanced placement, and dual enrollment programs uh, with no fees. Secondly, uh, we want to track our fifth graders and ninth graders and make sure that they are setting goals. So in fifth grade, they'll set goals to succeed through middle school and high school. And then again at ninth grade, they will revisit those goals and make a plan for post-secondary education. Our internship coordinator will simply work with our local businesses and make sure that we have adequate matches for our high school students that want to pursue internships. And then after school program, moving our after school program program coordinator to general funds will allow us to consider expanding after school opportunities and looking at opportunities for those to be more academic focused. Another area that we're very excited about for our elementary schools is expanding the number of hours our ed tech specialists are going to be uh, working. This position you might have heard it referred to as your computer teacher. Uh, what this is going to allow us to do is have more time for our teachers to work together uh, to prep and to also work in grade level PLCs where they 
discuss what students need to learn, how will they know that they learned it, and what do we do if students are or are not learning. We did uh, maintain our assistant principal and dean ratios at middle school. This was important to put into the general fund because we had ESSERS funding or federal funds that were expiring and we wanted to make sure we maintained that level of service. And with this last item, what we are looking at is creating professional learning opportunities that will be pre-K through 12 and provide our teachers with focus on the best practices in teaching and learning. Also here, this is related to our strong start goal. Our P3 coordinator will include our focus on read by grade three. And here we want to make sure that we are addressing achievement gaps early and often. The focus here is to increase our literacy and numeracy rates before they get into third grade. Um, here we also have shifting of grant funded positions into the general fund. This will allow us to have more stable funding for people who have been serving in our district uh, and they'll no longer be having to figure out funding through which grants are going to be supplementing them. With our child find, this is expansion of identifying children who may need special education services age to five, and this will be a gradual increase of those positions to better identify students earlier to receive special education services. And with that, I will kick it over to Dr. Lamarca. Thank you, Dr. Parks. Um, I'm very excited. I get to share a little bit about student engagement and belonging activities that are part of the strategic plan. I'm not going to touch on every item that's in the presentation, uh, but we certainly can answer any questions you might have for the various items. Uh, this, the first thing I'll talk about is the expansion of student voice. Very excited about this. This is something we've been doing for several years. Uh, but we do have an action plan to have student advisory councils in every building in the school within the next couple of years. And so we will be slightly uh, adding staff in order to accommodate that. Um, similarly, we are going to expand clubs and activities uh, in our secondary level as well as elementary, but primarily at the secondary level. Um, we have a lot of offerings currently in place, uh, especially at the high schools, and we know that engaging students through clubs and activities, getting them connected to the broader uh, school community is really important uh, for engagement, so we're excited about that. Um, and then also, um, and this is really important for our school district, as you all know, we have added sixth grade to the middle school. We've done that a, a couple years back. And now we're able to offer athletic opportunities to all of our sixth grade students uh, that are similar to the opportunities that our seventh grade and our eighth grade or eighth grade students enjoy. Um, moving forward, um, we you know we are a school district. Our schools are part of the community. We must partner uh, with our families and and, and, and community in order to best educate our students. So we're very excited to expand our volunteer services. We have approximately 8,000 volunteers currently in the school district doing various things. And we want to make that engagement more meaningful, both for our student benefit, but also for our volunteers who are giving up their time and effort. Um, we will be expanding our parent-teacher home visit uh, program. That's, this is an evidence-based program that's really designed to strengthen family engagement, family school partnerships. It, it, it enables our teachers to visit families in the home or in a location that is the choosing of the, the family. It just really strengthens those trusting relationships. 
um, and oh, we will be able to solidify and strengthen both our suicide prevention curriculum and screening as well as some of the bullying training uh, that we must provide to students at the secondary level on an annual basis. Uh, moving forward, um, we are excited again to be able to shift our Native American education consultant into our general fund. And, and really why that is key is it then opens up Title VI uh, funding that will help us expand services to our Native American families. Uh, we, uh, for example, envision expansion of our Paiute language course offerings. Um, we are also going to be shifting some of our reengagement facilitators over to the general fund. Our reengagement facilitators focus almost exclusively on our severely chronically absent students. Uh, and with attendance officer, they're one of the main strategies or, or folks that are using the strategies uh, to engage our students and to try and combat chronic absenteeism. And the last one that I will mention is a significant expansion of our translation and interpretation services. This will add critical staff so that we can better communicate with our families and our students uh, and give them opportunity to access our ed educational environment. And I believe that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ernst. Dr. LaMarca. So we talked earlier about the implementation of system-wide improvements. We'll go over some of those, which include a data analyst. We continue to see an ever-expanding role of data in education through multiple agencies and multiple reporting needs. We also want to make sure that we maintain our ability to offer timely support to our schools and to our departments. The second, the second position there is a program evaluator. And we are very excited about having these additional resources to help support our students and our schools. Among these many initiatives that have been described here tonight is the importance of evaluating our efforts around implementation and the progress that's being made on these initiatives and the results that are occurring from those. We also are looking to add a program analyst, and this program analyst we have in Washoe County School District a state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind um, internal data reporting system that our, our schools and our departments use regularly. We typically generate over 120,000 annual reports so that schools can use these during their MTSS processes and best support our students. As we move along, we can also see that we are going to work on a attendance system with some new software that's going to help with the overall efficiencies uh, for schools to track uh, tardies and absences and really best track our students. And then finally is our software module inside of Infant Campus to just make sure that we are increasing the effectiveness to support students that are on 504 plans. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Mathers. Thank you very much, Joe. So that was a very quick tour of the budget recommendations we have provided to the Board of Trustees certainly looking for any feedback um, either staff or tomorrow night the public would have on this plan but this is just a quick summary for you to see kind of where we're uh, recommending spending dollars if you combine the first two rows you know that's a total of um, a little over 14 million um, between general fund resources and largely English learners weighted funding so out of the $25 million between those two sources, you know, more than half are focused on really academic improvement and academic achievement. Uh, and notably, I think as well, $7.3 million alloca allocated towards pre-K opportunities. And, and we've known that's been an important need for a long, long time in Washoe County School District. So it's nice to be able to address that. Overall, you can see we are either authorizing um, or maintaining 241 and a half positions in the district. Um, so as Dr. Park said, and, and I should have probably explained at the top, there we added a number of positions to the school district budget through ESSER 
um, federal stimulus dollars over the last two years, but those monies do end. And so without the support of our general fund to maintain those positions, they would drop off and, and those people would need to find uh, other jobs in the district. So again, between preserving those types of jobs and adding new jobs, we're talking about 241 and a half positions. This is historic and unprecedented and you know we're excited to be able to do that but um, we hope here tonight you can see kind of the level of investment in the in these areas the executive team is recommending um, and again we're happy to answer any questions you may have about this plan and with that I will turn it over for, to Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much Mark. So we will take our first question. Excellent, thank you. And uh, some questions were covered in the presentation, which is fantastic. So I'm just going to kick it off with our first question. And that is, how were the major themes of this budget process determined? So I'm, I'm gonna take a first crack at this, but certainly Mr. Ernst, who was you know, helpful um, to say the least, in terms of development of these themes can chime in as well. But you know, certainly we like to be data driven. Um, Joe's office is the lead on that. Um, we look at achievement gaps in the district. Um, we look at all kinds of data to understand where our needs are. So that was a primary driver of development of these themes. Certainly we also, as, as we talked about, wanted to connect to the strategic plan. So these themes really come out of the goals of that work done um, over the last year to prepare that new strategic plan. We wanted, a, as Joe has said and, and Dr. Parks has said as well, we wanted to provide direct supports to our schools, that there's no substitute for that. And we wanted to be focused at the school level versus the central office level wherever we could. Um, and again, as, as Joe has remarked, we wanted to look across the spectrum uh, district-wide and address all levels of our education system from early childhood, which we know is so important, all the way through to high school. So those are some of the factors that you know, we, we took into account when developing these major themes. Again, there's just kind of a, a different way to articulate those strategic plan goals. Thank you. Um, we have our next question here, and uh, that is, what is weighted funding, and how can those funds be used? And that sounds like a CFO question. Yes, I'll, I'll as well. So weighted funding was a new concept um, that was articulated in Senate Bill 543 that created the new funding formula for school districts that was implemented in 2021. Before weighted funding, we had a hodgepodge of categorical grants. So we had Zoom, Zoom grants, Victory grants, um, Read by Grade 3, just a whole plethora of grants that were very earmarked that had to be reappropriated every two years, which made it very difficult to fill those positions and have any continuity from one biennium to the next in terms of providing supports to our highest need students. And so in replacement um, of categorical grants, this concept of weighted funding was introduced into law. And, and what weighted funding is, is um, additional funding for the additional supports for certain categories of students. And those weighted funding categories are English learners, uh, at-risk students, gifted and talented students, and then also special education students. That's actually our largest category of weighted funding. And so in each of those areas, we know we require greater interventions, support, staffing to support those students. And so the legislature approved this additional weighted funding to pay for those additional services those students need. That funding will continue and follow through every biennium. Stable funding, at least in concept, um, that we can rely upon year after year to provide those supports. In terms of what uses that funding can go through, go to, um, the law is very specific, certainly for English learners, 
um, and at-risk students, there's a very prescriptive list of explicit uses. Some of the examples of how that money can be used are early childhood programs, or school programs, actually employee incentives for uh, staff who works with those students, which we've begun executing on. Um, reading centers would be another uh, example of an eligible use of that funding. Um, and then there's a catch-all category at the uh, end of each section of the law for each level of weight or each type of weighted funding that allows a school district to uh, provide a proposal to the State Department of Education for a service that's not covered in that list of services. So it's very prescriptive, very restricted, can't use that funding for anything and everything you might want to use it for. It really is there to support those students in those categories. That's great, thank you. Um, our next question, uh, high needs schools are mentioned throughout the presentation. How are the high needs schools identified? Mr. Ernst, you had mentioned that at the top of the presentation. Would you mind going into just a little bit more detail on that? You bet, Dr. McNeil. So our high needs schools are primarily come as the result of the Nevada School Performance Framework. There's various metrics on the Nevada School Performance Framework. Those include proficiency levels in English, mathematics, science. It also looks at our student growth and achievement over time. So in large part when we as a system looked at our highest need schools, we looked at schools and their outcomes that they achieved on the Nevada School Performance Framework. A part of this is what we call CSI schools, Comprehensive School Improvement. These are schools that need some considerable support to help improve academic outcomes for our students. The idea around supporting our high needs uh, schools and students is to really intensify the supports to help create with immediate progress. Then as those improvements are being made, over time we're able to pull back and sustain some of the success and the progress that has been made. So in large part, that's how we go about uh, identifying our high needs schools. Thank you. Um, our next question, how will this support, such as instructional coaches, reduce fourth and fifth grade class sizes and provide more EL teachers to support students and schools? Thank you, Amber. So Dr. Parks, um, you know, this really kind of speaks to the ethos of the board really wanting to invest in, in our people, in our, in our employees. So can you go a little bit more into depth as far as what the instructional coaches and EL supports will look like. Absolutely, Dr. McNeil. Um, and as Mark mentioned, there was advocacy that we needed to put this funding to the greatest extent at the sites, and, and that's what we've done here. So with the instructional coaches, we've really focused on making sure in the elementary schools that our, our schools that have the greatest needs will have a coach. And we've kind of modified that approach to where they're going to be 50% with students and 50% coaching teachers. So we're really excited about that change. Uh, at the middle school, we really looked at our data around mathematics, and we knew we had to have an urgency for addressing um, middle school math. So again, 50% is going to be with students, and 50% will be coaching teachers. Uh, we're going to provide them with a lot of training around mathematical standards and the standards that students need to learn first. Um, the fourth and fifth grade uh, allocations, this is simply acknowledging that some at, when we're at 33 in a classroom, that starts to be a, a heavier lift for a teacher. So at our one and two star schools, we are going to get that down to 30 in those classes will not exceed 30. In the future, we will look at expanding to other grade, uh, to other schools as well, and hopefully beyond the one and two star schools. And then with our EL, here our approach was to come at serving our EL students a little bit more balanced. In the past, we focused on instructional coaches 
and we want to maintain that coaching approach with a philosophy that every teacher can meet the needs of their EL students. But we also acknowledge that uh, our newcomers, new to country, sometimes they need more intensive services. And so that's why we are expanding uh, from 71 down to 61 and providing more EL support at our sites. Thank you. Our next question, what are ed tech specialist positions and how do they currently support elementary schools? Thank you very much. Well, I can say a little bit about this uh, from being an interim principal. About this time last year over at Green Bray, the ETS was a very, very busy person. Um, and with the implementation of iReady, additional devices, but I'm gonna have our expert on the panel, Dr. Turner, speak to uh, the specifics on the ETS. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. As Dr. Parks outlined in the presentation, uh, the ETS positions uh, are at all, there's 66 of them at all of our elementary schools. They work an average of 21 hours a week, but sometimes those hours are supplemented by a principal's internal budgets. Um, they typically support computer instruction, uh, and as Dr. Parks outlined, their role also facilitates uh, teacher release and contact time with each other. The proposal was to add 10 hours to the 21 hours per week and dedicate that to tasks that, um, that support IT uh, tech support in terms of password resets, device management, device inventory, um, imaging software updates, all of, all of the tasks that, that may take a day or two for the IT staff to attend to, uh, adding 10 hours a week to the ETS positions will make that support much more local. This, this idea was generated, we solicited feedback from the elementary principals and we also worked closely with Dr. Parks' academics team and this input was rose to the top and so we're happy to provide this opportunity. We're happy for the, for the, the budget discussions and we're happy to serve the schools in this much more immediate means. That was great, thank you so much. Our next question, um, there's a significant investment to expand a number of pre-K programs throughout the budget. Will all of those programs be rolled out in the upcoming school year? Great question, thank you, Amber. So this you know, goes right to goal number one as far as a great beginning for our earliest learners. And so, Dr. Parks, you had mentioned um, when we were talking in about expansion of pre-K programs, how this might be something that um, would possibly be phased in. So can you kind of go into a little bit more depth as far as what that would look like? Yes, thank you, Dr. McNeil. So this is going to be a gradual expansion. Uh, preliminary uh, enrollment suggests that we're gonna expand about four pre-K programs next year. And of course, in the future, it'll be heavily dependent on enrollment in pre-K as well as our ability to get staffing to staff the needs at sites. Our next question pertains to student voice. What is student voice? What is the program and how does that support our students? Great question and very exciting question. So I'm gonna let Dr. Lamarca talk about student voice. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, students are active learners. They're not passive recipients of learning. And as such, they should be full participants in the learning process. Uh, students, we, we, we need to build the capacity of our students to, to speak and to find their voice and to use their voice to advocate for things that they want. And this really spans the spectrum. So when we talk about student voice, we're talking about student voice within the classroom that might be choices in what their projects look like what their learning looks like. It might be locally at a school, uh, some project that, that a group of students or the student body as a whole wants to take on to uh, support, for, for example, uh, a school community in another uh, geographic location that has suffered through a, a catastrophe. Um, and then at the district level, 
we we make lots of important decisions that's what we're doing here today is talking about some critical decisions and students should have a seat at the table informing those decisions so that's what student voice is all about I'll just say that um, our school district has been on the front of this for some period of time and it's just a wonderful thing when you watch students develop that voice and use that voice excellent I personally am very excited about the student voice program so that's a great answer um, our next question pertains to the parent teacher home visits uh, how does the parent teacher home visit program work and what benefits do students and families get from participating in that program Another wonderful initiative within our school district that's been going on for several years and that's under your umbrella, Dr. LaMarca. Thank you again. And again, thanks for the question. Love to talk about this. Uh, Delisa Crane, I should mention, she is our administrator over family school partnerships. She's a national leader in these sorts of efforts. Um, and, and she's been working with us to, to support parent teacher home visits for a, a while now. Uh, again, it's an evidence based program. I think I mentioned that in the beginning. Um, you know, parents are students' first teachers, and to honor that and respect that and to welcome students in our buildings, the first thing we have to do is welcome families into our buildings. Uh, we need to, to grow meaningful relationships with our families, recognizing them for who they are, what their needs are, um, and what better way to do that than to go visit them in their home or in a location that they choose. So the program primarily um, it has a teacher, uh, usually with a, with a pair, with a, an administrator or with some other staff member from the school or from the central office to go and visit with a family. And, and really the benefit for the student and for the family is to know that we embrace them, we include them, uh, we want to, to work with them to best support their child. Thank you. Our next question how many volunteers work within our schools now, which I think was mentioned in the presentation, and how do they primarily support our schools? Third time's a charm, Dr. LaMarca. <laughs> well, good grouping on the questions, Amber. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I did mention that right now in our system, we have more than 8,000 active volunteers. They do all sorts of things. Uh, volunteers will read to students. Uh, volunteers will be classroom aides. Uh, volunteers will chaperone events, field trips. Uh, many of our coaches at the high school level, middle school level are volunteers. Uh, we have uh, agencies that will provide internships and that's part of their volunteer uh, partnership. Um, the list goes on. Uh, people will come into offices and help with office work. Uh, they will assist schools on the playground, in the lunchroom. Um, they will make meaningful connections with students. They will help in terms of class sizes. So there are endless opportunities. I will say that part of what we, we intend to do with this expansion is to better understand where all of our uh, volunteers are, what they would like to do, and how we compare them best with schools. 8,000 volunteers is, you know, doing the math. It's 80 volunteers per school, and of course it's not going to work quite like that. Um, but if we can harness that resource, we can really support our schools and our staff. Excellent. Thank you. Our next question. There are positions listed as being shifted from a grant to the general fund. Why shift the positions from the grant to general fund? Thank you. And as somebody that used to have to walk down the hall to talk to the budget director and the CFO on, on some sort of impetus to in order to move a position over to the general fund but there are rational reasons in order to do that so mark do you want to take a take a turn at that and then joe if you want to follow up sure um i guess i would i've i've only been with the district a little over seven years so i'm a newbie um but what you know i saw and have observed is really because of the lack of funding for the school districts in Nevada, we've all had to, and certainly Washoe, cobble together funding sources in certain areas. And these are really core positions. So when we, we talk about our early childhood um, director, for example, you know, we've had to use four or five different funding sources to pay for that position. And that makes it really difficult to recruit and retain talented people 
when that funding is not stable, could change over time, evaporate, and you've always got to express to the, those people in those positions, well, we're not sure. We, we hope to have funding for your position next year, but we're not real sure. Um, so with this additional funding we received last year, that was an important priority that came through loud and clear through staff and again through the executive team that we need to stabilize those core positions that um, have kind of experienced this fragmented funding for so long. It will again help in terms of recruiting and retaining and just providing that stability in those critical areas that they really deserve. Um, so that's kind of the philosophical kind of notion. You know, Joe, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of more specifics or just further thoughts. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think that um, when we're looking at our grants, uh, oftentimes our grants present us with an opportunity to look at new programming. Dr. Lamarca talked about our parent-teacher home visits initially funded through grants. And when we are able to be at our best, we can take these grant-funded programs that we see having substantive impact impact in our schools and begin moving them over into the general budget. And so I think that's really kind of a complementary way of grants and our uh, general budget working together. I think an additional advantage when we are moving positions from grant funded positions uh, over to the general uh, budget are around grants have very specific parameters of which our employees need to operate within very specific to what is outlined in the grant. When we're able to fund them from our general fund, we can broaden the scope of our work and really integrate things in ways that are more substantive. So I think those are a couple of additional uh, elements that um, are behind why we're moving grant funded positions over to the general fund. Thank you. Our next question, how will chronic absenteeism be addressed through this plan? Great question, and obviously this is a topic that's been of great concern and a lot of discussion within our district, and it's also a topic at the state level, and it's certainly a topic at the national level. In fact, um, just within the last couple of days, there have been several media stories, one on NPR this morning with superintendents coming together around the issues of chronic absenteeism. So Dr. Lamarca, do you want to take a little bit more in depth on that? Sure. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, yeah, Troy mentioned, Dr. Parks mentioned earlier that sort of our North Star is around academics and achievement, and he's absolutely right. We're an educational institution. Our kids have to be in school in order for them to achieve and to grow. Um, so it is, a, it is a critical issue. It's a national issue, um, and it's a local issue. Um, our rates are too high, and they're considerably higher than they were pre-pandemic. Uh, we, we had an initial recovery the first year after the pandemic, um, but we kind of bumped up a little bit, and, and we need to address that. Um, chronic absenteeism support, is, it's a team sport. Um, they're, virtually everything we've talk, talked about tonight, to some degree, has a nexus to chronic absenteeism. Um, I would say specifically, and I, I took a quick note down here, um, all of our work around student voice, all of our work around club and activity expansion, um, to some extent, our parent-teacher home visit uh, program, our uh, expansion of services for Native American youth, all of those things should help with respect to chronic absenteeism. Um, and there are a variety of things, and, and I think Mr. Mathers talked about this at the beginning. Um, this is very specific funding relative to action steps uh, laid out for our Board of Trustees with respect to the strategic plan. There are many other cyclical activities that are underway as well, some of which are grant funded and some of which are in the general fund, quite frankly. We have attendance officers. In addition to the re-engagement specialists we talked about in this plan, we have re-engagement facilitators. Um, all those folks work daily uh, directly with students, getting them to school. Um, 
we have a fairly robust set of professional learning that we try to use to support our families so that's professional learning for parents but also for staff to understand some of the challenges that might be barriers for students to attend school uh, we are kind of excited with student voice we are working with a group of schools we have a donor who who provided some funding uh, essentially grant funding to start a middle school engagement project uh, we have that in six of our, our buildings right now and through our student voice office we are working with those students to hear from why aren't you attending or why aren't students attending what can we do differently um, we are also uh, um, trying to strengthen what we call a check-in check-out process where we really link a student very directly uh, with an adult in the building that they trust that they can check in with every day they can check out with every day um, and to just build that sense of connection uh, to the school environment so many things that we talked about tonight relate to chronic absenteeism and there are many other activities uh, in addition to that excellent thank you for that very thorough answer we have about five minutes left so I'm gonna ask one final question um, this is a great place to see uh, fees and, and career technical ed, international baccalaureate, advanced placement, and dual enrollment programs. Um, will those be available to all students is the question, essentially. So I think they're talking about the, the fees being uh, yes, paid. Yes, that's right. correct. Um, and this is probably one of the most exciting um, aspects of, of this budget presentation. This has been a long time coming. Um, but it's very true that this is a significant barrier for many of our families and so we were thrilled when this um, idea bubbled up and that the board supported this and so I'm going to have um, Dr. Parks go a little bit more into into detail as far as what that's going to be able to do. Thank you Dr. McNeil. Um, in a direct answer to the question it is yes and the reason being is that we know from feedback from students that even a slight fee of $75 can sometimes be a barrier for them to take an advanced placement course. Um, so we're very excited about this opportunity for our students. We hope that many students who maybe in the past didn't venture into taking dual enrollment courses or CTE courses uh, will take the chance. Uh, we know that when they get exposed to the, the rigors of advanced placement, they tend to accelerate their own learning and gain confidence for their futures. And often our students that maybe didn't plan on going to college end up on a college or advanced placement track. Great, um, that was our final question for the Q&A portion, so I will hand it back over to Interim Superintendent McNeil to wrap it up. Well, thank you so much, Amber, and, and thank you to all of you for attending our budget forum focused around our staff tonight. As you all know, a budget speaks to the priorities of the district, and I think we could all agree that, that our board has taken the time to review these priorities, and what you saw tonight is the compilation of those priorities. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank our leadership team for participating tonight. Um, I would say drive home safely uh, to all of our listeners, but you don't have to. Um, so to our leadership team, drive home tonight. And then tomorrow we'll have another budget forum focused around our community from 6 to 7, same time, same place. Um, so once again, thank you all for participating. Good night.